in, that sunk in, Southern Oregon Climate Action Now, our home group is in Medford, and their, um, their mission, and I'm going to read this, promote awareness and understanding about the causes and consequences of climate change, to develop solutions and motivate concerned citizens to take individual and collective action. And that's why we're here today. If you want to learn more about us, um, the cards in the back have our website on them. There will be other websites that you're going to want to take note of in this presentation. Uh, we're going to be passing out a sign-up sheet. Please sign up so we can keep you informed of other activities that we're doing. This presentation is also sponsored by our local library and our head librarian and uh, others may be sitting in from time to time. So Lee Tully is going to introduce our speaker tonight and Lee is also from Coastal Sophia. Hi everybody. I had a couple other little items to share with you before we get started. One is that our next meeting is always the fourth Wednesday here at the library at 530. But because of the way the calendar works out, our next one, which is November 27th, is the night before Thanksgiving. And the one after that is on, on Christmas, which I'm pretty sure you don't want to be here for that. I don't is open. But what we want to do the night before Thanksgiving, um, which is again the, the fourth Wednesday at 530 here at the library, the 27th, is have a little bit of a potluck, a really informal time. We can just get together with other like-minded folks and um, have some continuity for the season. And we're going to have uh, some art and craft pieces here available if you're interested in shopping a little bit for Christmas while you're here. We'll kick it off with a little bit of a talk, uh, just a really short little blurb about some of the things that are happening here locally with all of the uh, challenges of climate change like in forestry and fishing and so forth. So uh, do come. We're asking that you kind of think of it as a picnic because we want to reuse and recycle and not create trash. So if you can possibly remember to bring a plate and a cup and a spoon and a fork and, and all of that along with whatever potluck you step. We'll try and have a few backups if you forget, but we'd really appreciate it if you help us out on that. Um, what else? Let's see. Um, now, if I can only read my writing, that would really help. <laughs> um, yeah, glasses would help too. All right, so um, we in our talk today, we're asking that you not have any questions asked until the very end, and we're going to have an open discussion about the solutions that Tom's going to talk about um, and what we can, how we can participate in that. We really have a philosophy here at SOCAN that. If we all just carry our own little bucket, like the bucket brigade, it's not going to be that hard on any one of us to meet these challenges that are in our future. So think about what you can do to contribute while you're listening to the talk today. And um, see, cell phones off. Thank you. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. Let me tell you a little bit about our speaker. I'm really, really excited to have Tom Sakonic here. He has a long, long history in the world of climate and environmentalism. So I'm going to read some of this, or at least look at my notes here so I don't mess it up. Um, Dr. Tom Sukhanek is a marine biologist and has been working on climate change research and education for 20 years. His PhD is from the University of Washington, and he has conduct, been conducting research and teaching at the University of California, Davis, for 20 years. Secondly, he's been with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as a director of their Environmental Contaminants Division. And third, he's been with the U.S. Geological Survey as her lead scientist and research manager. He's conducted scientific research around the world and has produced over 150 scientific publications. Tom also spent seven years as the Western Regional Director of the National Institute for Global, Envir yeah, Global Environmental Change at the Department of Energy before joining UC Davis. He spent three years in the Virgin Islands teaching and conducting research on the coral reefs. That led him to co-author a book with Jacques Cousteau called The Marine Life of the Caribbean. 
Please join me in welcoming Dr. Thompson Cox. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, welcome everyone. I'm glad you could make it here tonight. Um, hopefully we'll uh, be able to communicate a little bit about the climate crisis that's going on today. But first, uh, we're, many of us are from all different walks of life and uh, personal persuasions and areas of expertise either during their career or now in retirement. So what I'd like to do is to get an idea of who all is here, the types of careers and the types of things that you guys do. So I'm just going to call out some types of things that people do and just if you would just raise your hand. I'm going to do a poll here. So uh, what about ocean and fisheries? Who, who has worked in ocean and fisheries? Okay. Um, forestry, logging, not too many. Uh, agriculture, maybe the lily fields or things like that. No. All right. Uh, ranching? Yeah. Um, what about at the prison? Any, any prison people? Any prisoners here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, military. More military, okay. Uh, how about education? Either teachers or students? Quite a few. Okay. Uh, science? There we go. All right. Uh, legal profession? Pretty spread out here. Uh, what about uh, the word politics? Who's in politics? There we go. And uh, how many people have children or grandchildren? All right, that's the best thing. So I respect all of the things that you've done and your own expertise in those different fields. And um, this evening I'd like to share some of my knowledge and expertise in the field that I'm working on, which is uh, marine biology, but also how marine biology interfaces with our changing climate, and not only locally, but around the world. So that's my goal. My goal is to provide scientific facts. I'm not going to try to sugarcoat anything. I'm also not going to exaggerate anything. These are the facts that are happening today. So with that, I think I'll uh, start where, where we uh, get the lights. Can we turn down some lights? I don't know if you heard part of that or not. There. One on the other side. No, nope. keep that one down. No. Two out of ones. Is that okay? Uh, yeah. One more. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Can we get these? Yep. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Right there? No, right there. Like that? Yeah. Yeah. Warm up a little bit? Yeah. There you go. Okay. All right. All right. Um, so let's take a look here. What I'm going to do tonight is talk a little bit about um, climate change. What's, what's the problem? How serious is it? What's the cause? And go from local to global impacts. And then we're going to have a quiz. Okay. <laughs> and in the quiz, we're going to talk about solutions, timing. How long is it going to take us to fix this problem? How can each of us make a difference? And then we'll have the final exam at the end. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Uh, so we're going to start out with some local issues first. I know that Bill um, Gore spoke uh, to the fisheries group uh, this last month, and he talked about many of these things that are happening in the ocean. But uh, all the world's oceans are warming, and we're not alone. It's, it's happening everywhere. So we need to figure out what's going on with that and how we can help stop it. Uh, we're all experiencing significant changes in the ocean, and some of those are um, so more gas and toxicosis, uh, ocean acidification, dead zones, diseases, declining fisheries, and alien species. This is not coming from outer space, but it's coming from other places. So uh, we'll take a look at some of those things. The more acid is caused by a red tide or toxic algae called Pseudonychia. And there's 54 species of this diatom Pseudonychia, and about 25 of them produce demoric acid. And we have one here, Pseudonychia australis, which accumulates in small fish and crabs. Uh, the neurotoxin effects are, affects some birds and mammals, uh, also sea lions and whales. And locally, uh, that ends up, uh, oh, I'm sorry, it causes lesions in the brain and can result in seizures or death. And that includes humans. That's why they close the fisheries, and uh, sometimes we have unexpected closings. Uh, ocean acidification. 
uh, let's see. The, the problem is, and we're going to get into this in a little more detail, but carbon dioxide in the atmosphere comes down and meets the ocean, and the ocean absorbs probably 92 to 93 percent of that carbon dioxide. When it does, that carbon dioxide gets absorbed into the ocean, and it mixes with the water, and it forms carbonic acid. There's uh, oxygen, carbon, and oxygen, that's carbon dioxide, water, carbonate, and two bicarbonate ions. And what's happening is, we have two things that are going on. Carbonic acid is formed, and when you have tiny little larvae that have to develop their tiny little shells, the acidity in the water prevents them from developing their shells, and they end up... Uh, ends up deteriorating the shells so they can never really grow up to be adult clams or snails or abalone or whatever. The second problem that we have with uh, acid acidification is the fact that this carbonate ion is the ion that the clams and the snails and the crabs use to build their shells. And what happens is through ocean acidification is that the, the CO2 strips out the, bi the carbonate ions or the bicarbonate ions and it doesn't allow the crabs and snails and, and all those other animals that use the calcium carbonate to build their shells. So they're deprived of the stuff that they need to build the shells. So that's the second thing that's happening with those, those animals. So this leads us to uh, depleted uh, populations of carbonate using uh, animals. So since 1850, the world's oceans have experienced about a 30% increase in acidity. That's uh, very, very significant. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But dead zones are, are all along our coast, and there's about 400 of those dead zones all around the world. It's caused by many different things, increased temperature, which is what the global warming is doing, changing wind patterns, ocean stratification, increased rainfall, increased stream flows. All of these contribute to large, uh, large uh, blooms of algae, which are then eaten by bacteria, and bacteria consume the oxygen in the water and end up with a dead zone where there's no oxygen, and anything that's living in that zone can't survive because there's no oxygen. So there, there's been uh, what quad, uh, quadrupling of zero oxygen zones around the world since 1950. Now there's 400 of them worldwide, and you can see where they are. And very low oxygen zones have increased 10 times since 1950. So all species are affected. Those that are mobile can either swim away or crawl away if they can. Other ones, if they're connected, like an anemone or a barnacle or something, they're gone. They can't survive. Uh, diseases. Um, that's a smart thing. So smarter than I am, I have to just put it there. Uh, diseases. There was a uh, large sea star wasting disease that passed through here in 2013. All of the sea stars were affected, not, not you know, all, of this, all of the species were affected. You can see what they look like when they get this, this wasting disease. And, um, uh, so this is Pycnopodia, the 21-armed star. It doesn't look like it has very many arms at this point, and Solaster. So this was all along our coast. We were here you know, at that time, and, and we're picking up lots of dead sea stars. Fisheries declines, lots of uh, reasons for that. There's uh, overfishing, uh, hydroelectric dams, higher ocean temperatures, changing wind patterns. Sardines experienced massive declines over the past 20 years. Salmon are extinct from 40% of their former streams. And salmon also are a keystone species, which means many other species depend on them for their survival. There's about 137 other species that depend on sea stars. And exotic species that come in. So, 2019 report this year um, in the, uh, uh, what's your paper here, the, the pilot? Oh, yeah. They required, reported this in August of this year, that uh, this Mola Mola sunfish uh, was seen by up the Thomas Bridge. It's 2,000 pounds, there's, a, there's one for scale, and these are a tropical fish and they're being found here. We found some on our beach uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, this nice striated sea butterfly. A whole, there's about 100, 150 species that have come up through this area. Some of them have never been seen here before. As the ocean is warming, 
those warm species are coming up higher and higher and higher in latitude. So, forestry, um, we've got uh, um, we know about the things that have happened here already. The Chetco Bar Fire in 2017 burned 191,000 acres. Uh, there was 1,500 firefighters camped out here on Ocean View Drive. Um, affected, um, seven, I think it only affected seven, about six or seven homes. But the loss of a lot of forest products. In California, there was 310 large fires last year, 1.6 million acres, 23,000 structures, and 93 fatalities. So this is becoming more and more and more uh, prevalent and abundant. Uh, and so you can see the trend. This is from 1970 to 2015 or 2018, and it's just going up and up and up. Some some years lower, some years higher, but the trend is up and up. And up. So here's all the fires that are in California last year. Mm -hmm. and the power just got turned off at two o'clock. It's very bad as today. Oh, you did it? Oh, yeah, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. So let's have a reality check. Earth is now experiencing extreme temperature fluctuations, snowpack fluctuations, storm winds, tornadoes, hurricanes. Uh, just had a, a set of tornadoes in Dallas uh, where they had 100,000 100, people lost power just two days ago. Uh, we've had extreme floods and droughts and fires and mudslides. Once the fires come, they wipe out the vegetation so there's no more roots to hold the soil. Then we get the mudslides wiping out homes as well. Uh, rapid sea level rise, increasing El Nino events, which cause massive changes in the productivity of fisheries, increasing extinction rates, uh, seasonality changes, extreme ocean productivity fluctuations like we've been talking about. So all of these things are happening faster and with more frequency and more intense. So that's what we're trying to deal with. And those things are happening daily. If you turn on the news, it doesn't matter whether you listen to the radio or TV or Reddit or newspaper, Every day there's things happening around the country and around the world that uh, we need to deal with. So let's do some of the basics first, make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, natural greenhouse effect, this is really what's causing all of this problem. Basically, the process is the sun beats down on the earth, the earth absorbs a bunch of heat, but some of that is reflected back into space. And we have these greenhouse gases, what are called greenhouse gases. Uh, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane, CH4. And that's the natural process that's been going on forever. But with the human enhanced greenhouse effect, we have the same basic process. The sun is beating down on the Earth. The Earth is heated up. Some of that reflects back into space. But we have an increased amount of these greenhouse gases, CO2, methane, and nitrous, ox uh, nitrous oxide. And those are heat-trapping gases. We've known about this for hundreds of years, back, back into the 1800s, we knew what was happening. And those people who were writing models and predicting what was going to happen way back in uh, 1860s, 1870s. So what is carbon dioxide? It's one molecule, uh, one atom of carbon, two atoms of oxygen, and there it is here. And there's only one in 2,500 molecules of air. So it's really rare, but it's very powerful as a heat trapping gas. <laughs> Uh, so where is it coming from? Well, basically, it's coming from the burning of fossil fuels. Fossil fuels meaning coal, oil, and gas. There's other, uh, other types of things. So power plants, planes, trains, and automobiles, all other kinds of combustion. And then it's also being produced a lot, actually, by cement production. Can I hold the, hold the questions to the end? Thanks. So where is it going? Where is it going? Uh, so down here, we have a leaf. And trees take up carbon dioxide, they give off oxygen. So here's the photosynthesis equation. Six carbon dioxides and six waters in the presence of sunlight produces this molecule here, which is c 2 c 6 h which is basically sugar or carbohydrates, plus some oxygen. So they are taking in carbon dioxide, giving us the oxygen that we breathe. And this is how, how it uh, basically is, is balanced. But we, we are overloading the system with carbon dioxide now. So this is the concentration of carbon dioxide in this side. And this is a thousand years ago, the year 1000 to 2000. And don't worry about this one here. This, so we've been sort of plugging along at about 280 parts per million of carbon dioxide up until we reached 
the Industrial Revolution, which started around 1750, 1800, at which point we started burning oil, coal, and natural gas. That started the increase in carbon dioxide production and started going up and up and up. This is what we call an exponential curve. Some people call it a hockey stick curve because it looks sort of like a hockey stick. Uh, but anyway, now it looks like it's going very, very high and up. Okay, that sort of jumped. But uh, anyway, the uh, global community has been emitting about 100 million tons of carbon dioxide every day into the Earth's atmosphere, about 40 billion tons a year. Now, carbon dioxide is, I mean, it doesn't, you can't smell it, taste it, feel it, see it. It doesn't seem to have any weight or mass, but it does. It has a lot of mass. Um, and fossil fuel emissions account for, this is fossil fuel emissions meaning oil, coal, and gas, account for 94% of the total carbon dioxide from all human sources as follows. So coal is contributing about 42%, oil about 33%, natural gas about almost 20%, and the cement plants are about 6%. And the changes in land use, like deforestation, when we're cutting down the Amazon rainforest, that has two, two problems. One is they're cutting down the trees that are absorbing the carbon dioxide, so that's bad. And they're cutting down the trees which are not producing the oxygen. The Amazon rainforest provides 20% of the oxygen on the Earth for us to breathe. So we're, we're in trouble. And just last month, we had a big problem where there were 74,000 fires in the Amazon. Um, so we're, we're running into double, double jeopardy on that. So who's producing all this carbon dioxide? If we look from 1960 to 2018, last year, China is producing the most, uh, this is carbon dioxide, in gigatons over here, almost 40 gigatons total. Um, India, US, and, and the US was, uh, was producing the most carbon dioxide up until 2005, at which point China passed us out and has continued to increase its carbon dioxide emissions uh, over, overall. And the problem, one of the problems is China is buying all of our coal and burning it in China <coughs> on the globe, producing more carbon dioxide on the globe. Ironically, China is not only burning the coal to produce carbon dioxide, but they're also leading the world in producing photo uh, photovoltaic uh, solar cells. So it's kind of working at both ends of the problem here. We'll talk more about solar in a little bit. So, um, there was a fellow named James Hansen who in, who in uh, 1988 uh, testified before Congress explaining that this problem that we knew about in the 1800s was actually getting worse and worse than he projected the kinds of temperature increases that we're having now. And uh, almost immediately, the scientists around the world started um, started producing reports, doing studies and research and projecting. Starting in 1990, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, produced reports about every five to seven years, updating what information they knew on how bad the situation was getting. The latest, the AR6 report, was supposed to come out last year, but because there's so many things happening and it's getting worse, they are needing to do more research and they're expected now to produce that AR6 in about 2022. So that's, uh, that's, that's reports that's expected to come out. There's also the U.S. Global Change Research Program, which I've worked on for a while, and that is also a series of very, very um, in-depth reports on what's happening with carbon dioxide and all of the potential solutions that we can uh, bring to the table. So, if we look at the, uh, the population of scientists who are working in this area, um, 95, 97% of them are really pretty convinced uh, that not only is climate change happening, global warming happening, but it's also a human cause. And uh, that has really changed recently. It's now up to like 99%. There are deniers out there, but the, the science is clear. There's no question about the validity and the veracity of the science. So we just need to uh, figure out how to, how to deal with this stuff. So, for those deniers who uh, bring up conspiracy theories, 
there's the ability to go to a website called skepticalscience.com if you guys have any questions or somebody that you're talking to has a question about some particular process like, oh, it's just the sun. Sun goes through these phases. Well, it's not just the sun, actually. You can go to this website, skepticalscience.com, put your question or your topic in this search bar, and it will provide you with three different answers. One very simplistic answer, very simple answer, which you know, is made for the layperson, maybe, maybe a little more. Then an intermediate level answer that is a little more complicated to get some of the chemistry and physics in there. And then a, a really complicated answer that provides you all of the scientific evidence. So it's a great site, and uh, you should go there anytime you have a question. I guess it is all cited, so we can follow through the scientific, the journal articles um, and things. They, they have the journal article cited in there. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. So, uh, so here's the temperature over here, which is uh, the, the blue line. And here's carbon dioxide. As carbon dioxide is increasing from 1880 all the way up to the present, so is temperature along with it also increasing, increasing, increasing. And so that's where we're getting the warming effect on the Earth. And the last time the concentration of CO2 was this high, humans didn't even exist. That's 800,000 to 20 million years ago. So it's a long time since uh, we had that concentration. And at that point, global temperatures were substantially higher. There was almost no ice on the planet. And sea level was about 100 feet higher. So we're risking getting up to that level of carbon dioxide that's going to cause massive uh, sea level rise as well. So the hottest years. Uh, this baseline here, this zero line, was an average temperature from January through December. This is an annual chart here. That was the average during that period. So each one of these lines is another year, and as it's gone forward to the present day, those temperatures have gone higher and higher and higher, all the way up to here. We're in 2019. Um, so the last, so the last the six years have all been the highest temperature six years on the globe. So almost every year, or at least a few years, we are exceeding the temperatures of the years before. It's just getting hotter and hotter. We're trying to keep, the scientific community feels that we're trying to keep the temperature below a 1.5 degree or 1.6 degree increase in temperature since the Industrial Revolution. That will hopefully prevent us from going past the, what we call a tipping point in which we can't stop the increase and it's just going to keep going and going. This is critical. We need to stop this. And that's, that was the average. So, where's all this heat going? Well, it turns out that the heat, 92 or 93 percent of all the heat that's being uh, produced and, and accumulated in, uh, on the Earth is going into the ocean, upper ocean and deep ocean. There's a little bit that goes into ice, a little bit into land, and a slight, tiny little black <coughs> line where there's some that stays in the air. But most of the heat stays in the ocean, and that's a problem for not only animals and plants, but also just in terms of everything else that's happening uh, in terms of uh, sea level rise. So here's an example of some of the some of the temperatures just this last year, in July, August. Uh, temperature records are being broken every single day. Las Vegas, 117. Tucson, 116. Phoenix, 119. And then 229 million out of the 329 million people we have in the United States were under a severe heat warning uh, back in July. So we're, we're uh, kind of hurt. That's, not, that's happening not just in the United States, it's happening everywhere. Here's a, here's a temperature plot from uh, Europe, and uh, this particular day it went up to 108.7 in Paris. So this is happening all over the Earth. I believe it was 120 in India, wasn't it? Uh, could have been. Yeah, it could have been. So along with the heat comes drought, and it's drying everything out. And uh, the west, the, the darker the color here, the greater the temperature and the more drought, the more drying effects there happen. So the rest of the country isn't doing as bad, but uh, right here we're, we're pretty bad. So this is focusing on California. Um, this particular color here, the swap all the way up and down, is exceptional drought. And they actually had to make a new color to, to express the drought level that was formed in that particular year, since 2016. So it's getting worse, and it's getting worse faster. 
because it's getting hotter all over the all over the globe, it's getting actually hotter in the Arctic than any place. So the North Pole is getting the worst increase in temperature. So if we look at 1984 versus 2016 in the uh, in the summertime, here's the extent of, of ice sea ice. Of course, that's the Northwest Passage. So this is sea ice in 1984, and compare that with 2016. It visibly, visually, you can see it's tremendously reduced. And if you look at this chart, this is different ages of ice. So young ice versus old ice. If you look over here, there's almost no old ice. It's all pretty much young ice. So it's being replaced every year, but it's not staying there. It's getting melted every single year. And uh, Greenland is uh, is being affected as well. That, uh, do I have that next? So July of this year. Melting Greenland ice sheet poured 197 billion tons of water into the North Atlantic in July alone. That's a lot of, a lot of water. So pretty soon, this is the extent of the ice sheet uh, declining over time to 2015. Just a steady decline. So you probably all heard of the polar vortex. You know, some people bring snowballs into Congress and they said, "What's this thing about global warming? We've got snow here in the middle of summer." Um, Sometimes that happens, and that's the polar vortex. And what happens is because the North Pole area is getting warmer and warmer, there's a jet stream around the pole, around the pole and it's a counterclockwise. And what happens is because it's heating up so much, the winds deflect and divert the jet, scre jet, jet stream that's around the North Pole. And what it does, it diverts it down. Okay. It diverts it down into the lower 48, and all of that cold air up in the Arctic gets shunted down here as what we call the polar vortex. That's why you're getting cold in odd times of the year down in, into the lower 48. So it's because of the global warming, not the opposite of global warming. So we know all about fires here. We're just really nice sunsets. <laughs> uh, 2018, 26 billion dollars worth of damages, and this is a very neat uh, website to go to. Uh, not so neat because it's all fires, but this is a, a site that you can go to, and each one of those little uh, icons, fire icons, has information on every single fire that's out there. You can click on that; it'll give you all of the information: how many, uh, when it started, what the progress is to, to put it out, uh, how many acres. Uh, how many uh, structures have been uh, destroyed, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, um, this is the interactive wildfire tracker. And you can get that. And interestingly, August of 2016, um, California was burning up, but most people didn't know that Alaska was even worse. It was really going through very hellish times in 2016. Of course, the oceans were doing the same thing. There was a huge heat wave all over the earth accumulating in this upper areas as well as the ocean like the, um, the Barrier, Great Barrier Reef was also affected and about 80% of the corals in the Great Barrier Reef were affected in 2016 by a massive blob of hot water coming through there. So, uh, 2019 storms, massive storms, and this is an example of uh, one of the types of storms called a rain bomb in Hawaii in 2015. Was this is uh, 15 inches of rain in 24 hours. And another one in Phoenix, Arizona, 2017. I would not want to be caught in one of those, but uh, these are happening with more frequency now than they ever were before. And our hurricanes. Hurricanes aren't necessarily happening in greater frequency, but they're happening in greater intensity. So more Cat 5, Cat 4, and Cat 5 hurricanes are affecting us. Uh, here's an example of some of those. Uh, Irma, Jose, Maria, uh, uh, Michael in 2018, and the one that happened just not long ago, Dorian, uh, didn't hit, hit the mainland here in Florida so much, but it had 165 mile an hour winds with gusts to 200 miles an hour. Mm. And the, the problem is that what, what these more recent hurricanes are doing is that they're stalling. And they stay in one place for a long time or move very slowly, like this one was moving at uh, move this myself, uh, one mile an hour. So it sat there for days and days and days, just pouring huge amounts of rain into that, and wind. Tornadoes, tornado frequency is up. 
Uh, we had over a thousand tornadoes reported this year, and that was a couple months ago. And uh, as of May, they were up 20% over 2018. And there's some bigger tornadoes, so you can see that increase in the bigger tornadoes happening. SLR, uh, what's that? Single lens reflex. Single lens reflex. Thank you very much. Who's the camera guy? <laughs> Oops. So, yes, it is sea, uh, sea level rise. Uh, glaciers are calving off, and some problems with some of the islands. Actually, sea level rise is caused by a wide variety of different processes. I don't have time to go over them today, but basically, there's a few of them that are important. About 50% of sea level rise is caused from the melting of glaciers and ice caps. About 50% is caused from seawater expansion. Now, it doesn't seem like seawater would expand that much, but yeah, 50% of that sea level rise is expanding water. And uh, a third 50% is caused by... Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, it's historic global mean. This is the sea level rise over the past 500 years or so. and. Um, or a thousand years actually. Uh, so about the Industrial Revolution, again, at that same time period, about 1800, uh, it started going up exponentially and it's still going up. Initially it was going at about uh, half an inch per decade, now it's going at uh, three times that amount, from 1993 to 2012. So we're increasing the sea level rise speed. So, something a little closer on the West Coast, uh, I'll give you an example of sea level rise, of what's happening here, and what we project will happen. Uh, the, sea, the sea is not flat. There's different sea level heights all over the world. And here's an example in Seattle. Uh, between Seattle and Southern California, there's an eight foot difference in the sea level. Um, a little closer here, in San Francisco Bay, uh, there's a four foot difference between Sassoon Bay and the South Bay. And this, the sea level is uh, higher in the South Bay than it is in Sassoon Bay. So let's take a closer look at what's happening there. So here's, here's the South Bay up here. This is the bay itself. And here's Route 101, here's Palo Alto. I'm sure most of you know where these places are. And if we have a 100 year, um, 100 year storm surge, no, no sea level rise, just a 100 year storm surge, this is the area that the, the bay this thing, will come down and, and vary. Right over 101, all of these areas here will be inundated. If we then add to that a 50, 50 centimeter uh, sea level rise, it's going to bring it out to this area, blue area. A 100 centimeter sea level rise will bring it out to the yellow. And a 150 centimeter sea level rise will bring it out to the red. So let's take a look at what's down in the South Bay. We've got uh, Google, uh, Yahoo, uh, Dell, Intuit, basically most of the Silicon Valley places there. And uh, I do need to take a poll right now, audience participation. How many people own an iPhone or an iPad or a computer or have shares in stock of Apple? Okay, so I have to tell you that you're in good shape. Apple's Cupertino's place is way down here, so they're probably not going to be fair. <laughs> That's only because our son works with Apple too. So you're supporting his, his uh, salary. But thank you very much for doing that. Okay, atolls. Atolls are a strange kind of formation uh, Darwin actually first described. And uh, th the thing is about them, what's interesting is that they're only about six feet above sea level. They're out in the Pacific, there are also some in the Atlantic, but mostly in the Pacific. And uh, they're, they're formed basically in these sort of these round uh, configurations. And sometimes they get a little overloaded. Uh, people who are uh, crazy building on them. This is in the Maldives and the Indian Ocean. But there's lots of places now. Uh, that the island nations are worried, they're not just worried, they're moving, okay? They're already doing this. So here's uh, Carteret Islands. They have about 2,000 people, and they've made arrangements to move those 2,000 people over to the mainland in Papua New Guinea. The uh, people in Tuvalu, about 10,000 people, and they've uh, already uh, contracted with uh, the southern island of New Zealand, and they're moving their people down there. The uh, people in the Kiribati, or Kiribati, some people say, uh, 110,000 people. 
and they're moving all the way down to some areas in Fiji. So they're already getting inundated. These people have to get off these islands because they're not very high and they're living on atolls. And finally, up here, the Shishmaref, Alaska, and the Inupiaq Eskimos are living on the shoreline, but because their villages have been protected by sea ice, now that the sea ice is all melting, those big waves that come in with storms are wiping out their village. So they need to move too. They're having to move back into the mainland further and further to get away from those, uh, those problems. So, um, when we reach um, sea level rise levels that uh, affect like Florida and Shanghai, we're going to be in trouble. Uh, some of this geopolitical refugee, you think there's uh, problems with refugees now. Uh, we are going to be in really sad shape. And I'm going to ask you to watch this particular area in Florida. Uh, we're expecting about this much to disappear. So about maybe a quarter to a third of that lower part of Florida is going to disappear under the sea. I uh, would? By 2050. Up here, by 2050. And now Shanghai, China, this is virtually all of, all of Shanghai. Now, watch closely. By 2050, we're going to look at almost all of Shanghai. Wow. So we are going to see hundreds and hundreds of millions of people having to migrate to different places, and that's going to cause wars, no question about it. Resources are going to be limited, and uh, this, is, this is what we're going to be experiencing if we don't solve this problem. So, solutions. What are our solutions? Um, what kind of alternative energy sources can we have without fossil fuels? Well, we've got a whole cadre of different options. We've got wind, we've got solar, we've got tidal, hydroelectric, ocean, ocean thermal energy conversion, uh, hydrogen fuel cell cars, which are just starting now. There's some uh, uh, recharging stations around California, but they're in their infancy right now. Currents, waves, geothermal. Uh, we have some ge geothermal places in California, Lake County. So we have all of these options. We need to be using everything, not just one or the other. We need to be using all of these. So take a look at this. Every two minutes, the energy reaching the Earth from the sun is equivalent so the whole annual energy usage by humanity. How much energy is that? We need to harness that energy and put, put it to use uh, by solar. And we're, that's, this is the thing that we're doing the most right now in advancing in solar. But China is taking over the market. When I say we, I mean the globe. So we could, we could really be taking advantage of that. So here's the price of solar in 2014, coming down, 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 down every year. And here's 2018. It's, it's really making it uh, very affordable for people to use solar. Um, the gross cost of solar has uh, fallen from $51,000 for a home solar, solar system down to $18,000. And if you subtract the 30% uh, federal tax credit, you're down to about twelve dollars or $13,000 for a whole home solar uh, uh, photoelectric uh, cell system. So, in May of last year, the California Energy Commission ruled that all new homes after 2020 must have solar. 100% of the energy usage needs to be solar. And you can do some offsets with other things, but it has to be zero energy uh, net. Okay? So that's, that's fantastic. Um, not only residential, but there is grid scale solar for large communities and cities. Uh, these are trackers. So they move with the sun, 50 to 30 degrees, and um, take advantage of the angle of the sun to get maximum um, energy to solar. Now this is another type of solar. I'm not sure if everyone has seen these before, but these are called heliostats. These are also called solar power towers. Movable mirrors, each one of these little dots is a mirror, and they're all pointing up towards that big tower. And the tower has liquid sodium or molten salts in it. And the problem with, one of the problems with solar is that we only got solar for how many hours a day, right? So this takes care of that problem because the molten salts retain them at high heat capacity and they store that heat overnight. So you can use that energy overnight instead of being limited by the amount of time that the sun is uh, shining. So these are amazing. There's a lot of these starting to be built around. Here's a 10 megawatt plant, a 20 megawatt plant in Seville, Spain. These enormous, enormous facilities. And those those uh, 
towers are four to five hundred feet high, five hundred and forty-one feet high. And in the Mojave Desert, uh, we have quite a number of them. The, uh, the gold, gold uh, dots are um, uh, photovoltaic systems, the grid, grid scale, and the red ones are the uh, thermal power towers. So we have huge amounts of stuff there. Um, in March of uh, last year, utility-grade solar energy met 50% of California's total electrical power demand for the first time. Wow. Uh, we're not doing that necessarily all year long. Now, in, in, uh, in March, there wasn't as much power needed, so it was a low level, but it's, it's, we're getting there. Um, all, also wind. Uh, huge wind farms, uh, some of them that you know of. Um, wind provides 4.3% of the world's energy, up 1% from 2006. We're not going as fast, but we're doing lots of it. This is the sort of uh, sandboard Gonio Pass in Palm Springs. And then you probably all know about Alamont Pass by the more. And uh, one of the oldest and largest wind turbine farms in the world. Um, this is the North Sea off the coast of England. Uh, we were there this last year. And massive, massive ocean wind farms, wind turbines. Um, this, is, this is the North Sea. Each one of those red dots is a uh, wind turbine farm. And if we look over here, here's the North Sea. Each one of those little icons of a, of a propeller is an existing wind farm. And the pink, uh, um, let's see. yeah, the pink is already approved new wind, wind farm uh, areas, plots. And the orange up here are new applications for more wind farms. So the North Sea is just loaded with wind farms. And that's great. Uh, Germany is, has taken over the world power with wind. They're doing a fantastic job. Uh, we just returned from Germany. There's wind farms on every village. Thousand-year-old villages have the wind farms operating on them. It's fantastic. Okay, transportation. <laughs> this guy is not producing much carbon dioxide except it's coming out of his mouth. Um, but transportation takes up or produces about 40% of all carbon dioxide emissions, at least uh, on, on a global scale. So here's one of the solutions uh, by a Tesla. If you don't want to buy your uh, honey a Tesla, there's options for you. Uh, here's a website uh, that's uh, what EV to buy. What EV should I buy? Electric vehicle to buy. So you should go there. It, it looks sort of like this, or it did last year, where you've got how many battery miles the vehicle can, can give you, uh, the cost of the vehicle, that's the uh, economy of it. Uh, and this was for 2018 models, but now they have virtually every single car manufacturer out there is producing some form of electric vehicle, whether it be a full battery vehicle, you know, fully electric, uh, plug-in hybrid, electric and gas, or uh, uh, these uh, battery electric, or the fuel cell electric vehicle. So go to the site, and if you're interested in buying an electric vehicle, this will tell you where in that range you can afford, what are you going to get, like the Tesla is now going up to about 320 miles range, and they're getting better and better every single year. 365. 365, thank you very much. We hear 370. <laughs> Okay, um, Okay. some resolutions have been passed in various countries, uh, put in, putting a ban on diesel and or all gasoline engines by 2050 to 2050. All of these countries have passed those resolutions. Denmark, Italy, <coughs> India, Norway, Ireland, Brussels, United Kingdom, Taiwan, Germany, and cities, uh, Madrid, Mexico City, Paris, and in the United States, reducing vehicle CO2 emissions by the T0 by 2040 to 2050. These states have already done that. California, Connecticut, Maryland, Massachusetts, New York, Oregon, Rhode Island, So, today for Oregon. Um, I beg your pardon? Reduce the CO2 emissions to zero? Or, or committed to? Committed to, yes. By 2040 to 2050. So, um, Tesla, as you probably know, has already produced lots of all electric vehicles. 
They are also producing, you may, may or may not know, they're also producing semi trucks. And uh, this just came out in uh, 2017. They're producing them this year. And uh, that, if you just take the cab, in fact, if you're worried about speed, uh, the cab will go 0 to 60 in 5 seconds. <laughs> if you put the trailer on there, it's going to take a whopping 20 seconds. <laughs> and they're being auto automated. So they're doing autonomous vehicles as well. And these are great for truck farms. I mean, you go from point A to point B, plug it in, recharge the battery, go from point B to point A, just keep going back and forth. And now they're doing uh, uh, autonomous vehicles as well. So. You've probably seen the news article about the two yeah. people sitting in the Tesla car, totally asleep when their car is driving down the road. That's coming to a state near you. <laughs> and what's interesting is it's not just Tesla that's making these. All of these companies are making uh, making electric semis. All of them. So this one is, is an autonomous one that hasn't been produced yet. But uh, imagine that thing coming down the highway. <laughs> <laughs> And the military. The military is on it. They have been on it for decades. And these are all the various different hybrid or hybrid or pure electric vehicles, even tanks. They've got hyperelectric drive tanks. And um, they're, you know, they're, they know what's coming. They've known what's coming for decades. So has everybody else except some people. <laughs> the same thing with the ferries. They're kind of like uh, truck farms. They go from point A to point B and point B to point A. And uh, all, this, all the ferries are transforming into electric vehicles, but electric boats as well. 70% uh, of the 180 strong Norwegian ferries will be converted to batteries as well. Rolls Royce and other ferries. Uh, today, over 100 hybrid ships are in operation worldwide. And again, the military is right up there. This is a, the first. Navy's first hybrid drive warship, a hybrid powered USS Bacon Island, a WASP class amphibious assault ship. They call it the Prius of the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> they, they first put it out in 2009, it didn't work so well, so they put it back and redid it in 2011. And they call this the Great the Green Navy. Um, also, the hybrid uh, guided missile destroyer, USS Truxton. I mean, they're doing everything. So, March 2018, unfortunately, President Trump's budget for 2019 canceled a program to install fuel-efficient hybrid electric drives in 34 destroyers. We're talking nuclear here, right? Um, no, uh, no, it's not nuclear. These are the hybrids. Diesel electric. Plug them in? Yeah. Well, they're also using a combination of diesel, electric, and battery. Oh, and um, this is Harbor Air Company in Vancouver, BC. Uh, March 2019, they've been experimenting with different uh, size engines, 350, 500, and 70, 750 horsepower engines, running completely by batteries. And they, they plan to be the first all electric air. So the big bugaboo is how do we make air, airplanes battery driven, electric, electrified? Airbus is running a, a test now or, or a contest to see who can build the most efficient electric airplanes. So there's a big contest going on. We're, we're getting there. We're really getting there. Okay, what are some fuel engineering solutions to lower atmospheric carbon dioxide? So we've been talking mostly about lowering emissions from various vehicles, from what do we use for electricity. That's not going to do it. Unfortunately, the carbon dioxide that are produced is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere stays there for anywhere from 500 to 1,000 or 2,000 years, which is not good. Um, so we need not only to lower emissions from the existing vehicles and, and power plants and, and cement plants, but we also need to start taking carbon dioxide out of the existing atmosphere and getting rid of it, pumping it down into the earth or doing something with it. So there are companies out there, oh, this is the best carbon dioxide sucker up where there is, and there's actually laboratory experiments going on creating artificial reefs that can, that can uh, absorb carbon dioxide. And uh, the first, do I have it here? No. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. So this is uh, a company called Global Thermostat. 
And what we need to do with this is to start sucking that carbon dioxide out of the air like this, reversing that process, bringing it down. So the CO2, again, represents only 1 in 2,500 molecules in the air. That's 300 times less than that's what's being produced by smokestacks. So we really need to have very efficient systems that are going to suck that carbon dioxide out of the air. And uh, CO2 capture from the air was first developed by Nazi scientists who used liquid sorbents to remove uh, accumulations of CO2 in submarines. And now we're using very similar kinds of sorbents. Uh, this one, uh, global thermostat, is using solids. CO2 plus uh, amines produces a carbonate, which uh, solidifies the, the carbon dioxide. So there's one in Menlo Park. There's one in Huntsville, Alabama. That's just one company. Another company called Carbon Engineering in Calgary, Canada, is, is doing another prototype. Now, all of this is, right now is very expensive, and it costs a huge amount of energy to drive those. But as we increase the solar and the wind and the hydroelectric options for getting energy, we can then drive all of these uh, facilities to start removing that carbon dioxide. <coughs> so here's all the companies, the seven companies out there that are doing this direct air capture experiments. We have the technology to do this. It's just a matter of will. So let's think back to 50 years ago, Apollo 11, first man on the moon. I want to read you a quote from JFK. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to do this not because it's easy, but because it's hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our engine, engine energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone and one which we need to intend to win. This is where we are right now with global climate change and what we need to do is to fix it. The tools it took to accomplish that NASA mission, in eight years they had 400,000 people working for NASA. Literally they had to invent the rocket, the spaceship, the spacesuits, all of that had to be invented from scratch. We don't have to invent this stuff from scratch. We have the technology that we can use right now. This iPhone, any iPhone right now, has more processing power than every NASA computer in existence in the early 1960s. We have the ability. We just need to do it. Oh dear, that worked. I knew this was going to come up. Uh, so here's a politician's discovery discussing global warming. You can recognize one of them. That's a painting from, from Berlin. Anyway, uh, that's the bad news. The good news is over 6,000 companies in 7,000 cities in 133 countries are implementing greenhouse gas emissions reductions protocols and following the Paris Agreement protocols. So despite the fact that some people, some countries, are not, there's many countries who are doing this. So back in 2015 was the Paris Climate Accord. And President Obama brought together <coughs> Peter, who brought together 194 countries to sign the Paris Agreement. Now that was ratified in 2016. Uh, initially, it was it was agreed upon by all but two countries in the world, and that was Syria because they were at war, and it was Nicaragua because Nicaragua didn't feel like we were doing much, uh, enough to solve the problem. But they both also ratified it in 2016. So in 2016, we had 100, 196 countries signed up. 2017, President Trump vetoed that, and he is pulling the US out of the Paris Accord, as you all probably well know. Uh, so that is still on the docket. That's still happening right now. And um, here's, here's a, just a little information about what the registered voters think. So this is from 2008 to 2018. The dark line is liberal Democrats. This is how much they uh, believe or think global warming is caused mostly by human activities. These are moderate Democrats. Uh, the black one is an average of all of them. The pink one is liberal moderate Republicans, and this is conservative Republicans. So you can see where the thinking is in all of these different political groups. And we just need to raise consciousness and uh, have a consensus here that we need to solve this problem. 
So, where do we go from here? Good question. Put your thinking caps on. I'm going to talk to you about where we are now. James Hansen, I mentioned to you, uh, warned us in 1988. He testified behind uh, to Congress on where we were going with our global warming. So this is the emissions going up and up and up. Uh, and when he did that in 1988, we were at about 20 gigatons, uh, 20 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. We're nearly double that now. That was only 1988. If we did, if we uh, started to uh, take out all of the carbon dioxide uh, from the Earth, from all the countries in the world, in 2019, this year, um, we would have only had to reduce, these are all projections, these are all model projections, showing how much we had to reduce the carbon dioxide to get it down to reasonable levels, so that we didn't pass that one of those tipping points. If we did that in 2019, almost over, we only would have had to reduce our emissions by 2% per year. That's, that's not bad. We could have done that. Now, if we do it right now, um, we're up here. I, I messed that up. Yeah. 88. Yes, 88, sorry. We would have to do it 2% um, per year. So now we're up here, <coughs> where we are with carbon emissions, almost 40 gigatons per year. If we do that in 2019, we would have to remove or reduce emissions by 5% per year. Now each one of these little dots, if you can see them, are one year. So there's 10 more dots out there that bring us to 2029 or 2030. If we start there, we're going to have to re reduce our emissions by 9% per year in order to get us down below that tipping point. So we're in trouble. We're in trouble. So we need to act fast. We need to do this within the next 10 to 12 years. Not start in 10 to 12 years. We need to fix this. Start removing all of that carbon dioxide, reducing emissions by as soon as possible within the next 10 to 12 years. We don't have much time. We need to make sure that our members of Congress understand that and that we implement the programs federally, regionally, locally to accomplish this problem. Get rid of it. So there's, there's bills in Congress. Uh, this is one of them, H.R. Uh, 763, that uh, is called the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act of 2019. It's in both the House and the Senate. And there's 57 Democrats as co-sponsors and one Republican. Uh, they're opposing these carbon reduction bills, um, so that they haven't been voted on. They're just sitting there. And this, this particular one says, OK, we have to put a price on carbon. We start at $15 a ton, and every year it's increased by $10 a ton. And pretty soon, the price of the fossil fuels would become much greater than the price of alternative energy sources. And therefore, we would choose, the marketplace will choose, the fact that we will choose alternative energy sources. So this one, basically, the, the, the money that we extract from the fossil fuel companies will be sent out to the consumers, obviously. And that will be put, the, that money will be put into a, the, the money that we charge the fossil fuel company will be put into a trust. And that trust will then be given back to the consumers in some way, like their taxes, tax rebates. So it's, it's a zero-sum game. We get our money back that we expend on buying fossil fuels. So interestingly, um, these are the countries that have implemented a price on carbon. This one, not so much. <laughs> um, so the bottom line is we all need to use the tools in all of our toolboxes. Solar, wind, hydro, electric tanks, airplanes, direct capture, electric cars, all of those things. All countries must participate. We need grid-scale battery storage, which is coming on pretty quickly now. We need legislation to put a price on carbon. And currently, there's seven carbon pricing bills in the 116th Congress, from 2019 to 2020. Not one of them has been voted on, unfortunately. So the fossil fuel industry also, 191 countries, 
is, is $4.7 trillion of subsidies that are going to fossil fuel companies. That's 6.3% of global GDP. In 2017, it's $5.2 trillion being given to the fossil fuel companies. And who's doing this? China, interestingly, is giving $1.4 trillion. The United States is giving almost a half a trillion dollars. And this is, you know, this is uh, data from the International Monetary Fund. So, basically, if we could use some of this $5.2 trillion to invest into alternative energy sources, it would be way ahead of the game, and it would probably solve this problem pretty quickly. So we need to figure out some way to, uh, to deal with this. So I have handouts that uh, you can have. And these are basically what can we do personally. Um, there's energy product con uh, consumption things that we can do, water and vegetation things, transportation things, and there's a uh, key on the back that tells you why we should be doing these things. These are all things we can do in our home. But the bottom line is really we need to vote. We need to vote for those individuals who will help solve the problem that we all need to solve very, very quickly. So, most critical action in all local, state, and national elections, we need to vote there. And we can succeed. Thank you very much. period of time here to have some discussion. I'm going to start these going around um, and also tell you that Tom has been on KCIW Reality Check and he'll be on for a few more days if you want to get a little bit more about Tom Satanic. And yes, yeah, so we're going to talk about solutions, what we can do. Certainly I think one of the things, we'll do those things on this lovely handout and also persuade people. It's going to take all of us. Um, what I mentioned also, we've got on that forum that's going around, we've got Tom's website. We can also go to SOCAM.ECO or SOCAM slash Coastal.ECO to find our website and the Greater SOCAM website. And um, yeah. Are, are any of those slides available on your website? Um, most of them are on my website. Um, this is being filmed, uh, so this could be available. So one of the other things that we've done in oh, California is to uh, form what we call huddles. Groups of individuals who work towards solving some of these problems. And it's, a, it's a sort of an uh, activist group that is working on climate change as well, but getting people together to write letters or postcards texting, uh, emailing, sending messages to your Congress people. Um, and that is both thanking them for things that they do right and informing them how they could help solve this problem. So we all need to get a, get a handle on that and we can, uh, we can help to solve this problem. Any other questions? SOCAN is interested in getting one of these uh, types of groups together that is willing to write letters to your members of Congress and uh, communicate with them in the right way to help solve this. Is yes. there anyone who would really like to sign up for that? Because I can take your name down now. We've got you on the contact sheet already for your contact information. So if you'd like to be part of that, please let me know. Also, um, if you haven't signed up on that sign-up sheet before you go, let's get your name and everything so we can stay in touch. Other questions? I have a little question uh, concerning the oceans and the warming of the ocean and us seeing them all holding them up and they should be catching mocking and everything. What happens to the fish? Do they follow the warm water back to where they belong or do they perish because they're up here to change it? I haven't put any tags on them, so I don't really know. <laughs> but uh, they're going to follow the warm water. Mm -hmm. And if they can sense that the water is getting too cold, they'll probably go back some. But some of them may just get diverted off where it's cold and they're not going to make it. Might they get lost? They might get lost. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yes. Can you make sure to tell everyone how they can hear your program, KCIW? 
Yeah, sure. Um, if you have caught the KCIW uh, show, you can do that. If you haven't caught, you can do that by going to KCIW.org, looking up the programs and see the schedule where you can find when it's being broadcast. However, it's going to stay on the website for who knows how long, a long time. Uh, in the form of a podcast, so that's another alternative way to listen to it. So could SOCAN put those podcast links onto your website? Onto the, the SOCAN. SOCAN website, yes. So that would be the easiest way, I think. We do that already. The is 100.7. That's right, 100.7, case you couldn't hear that. Yes. I just want to say I heard the broadcast on the radio, and when I saw your name attached to this presentation, I knew I wanted to, to hear more from you. What stuck out in my mind was Skeptical Science, yeah. that website, yeah. and the different answers <coughs> to the questions so that everybody can understand. It's a great site. Yeah, it's yeah, very it's informative. A great source. Hey, Tom. Is there, um, can you give me a, uh, possibly a reason why that a lot of solar forecasting doesn't include such things as solar forecasting or the loss of our magnetic field? Why that they haven't included that information along with this? Loss of the magnetic field? Yeah. Not sure. the, uh, the correlation between the rise of the CO2 since the early 1800s actually also correlates and with the loss and the drop of our magnetic field on the Earth as they get ready to switch borders. Okay. So I just kind of wondered, a lot of the news, a lot of the science that I'm involved with also um, kind of looks down upon solar forecasters and people who actually write these algorithms that show um, some of our path of the future as to not including information from solar forcing, but because of also the drop of our solar field we also are going to have a higher perturbation of cloud nucleation. So, where instead of where everybody's afraid that the Earth's actually going to get hotter, yeah, there will be a short time and period where the world where the Earth world will get a little warmer. But then, as soon as we reach to a certain point of loss of, of our solar field around the Earth, we're actually going to get so much cloud nucleation. We're actually going to have to reverse where we're actually going to drop in temperature and we're going to these types of things actually proceed or pre go before every single polar um, ice event on the earth uh, showing that we have problems where we get a lot more solar radiation hitting the earth that actually causes more clouds to be made then allows a lot more of that energy to bounce back off into the and away from the earth instead of causing the earth to warm up it causes us to cool down okay you got a lot of things in there there's uh, <laughs> solar solar cycles for sure and that does influence the temperature on the earth but it is not related to the increase that we're experiencing now like okay. we've already shown that through many different experiments and many different analyses okay. now yes when the sun is out when we go through these solar systems or solar cycles um, there is more water vapor. Water vapor is another form of greenhouse gas mm -hmm. that does increase the temperature. Uh, but there's many, many natural cycles. Some of them are very short to run, others are long term, 10,000 years, 100,000 years, and those cycles will influence the temperature of the Earth as well. But right now, because we're in such a short period of time, since 1800, this is the carbon dioxide and the greenhouse gases are really what's causing this. And it's happening so fast and so high that's what we need to deal with right now. Now, yes, maybe in 10,000 years there will be another reversal or a cycle or an attempt at making another they ice age. They actually say that in my lifetime we'll actually watch a reversal of the South and North Poles. Well, go to Skeptical Science. <laughs> <laughs> Plug that in and let me know what you find out. Um, Question. In terms of the USA, are we leveling out in our consumption at all, like recently, since things have been probably too soon to even see if there's much change, or are we just still like heading skyward? Emissions. Well, yeah, emissions. Emissions. Um, we are, well, you saw from the figure, we are going up in, in about 3% per year. 3% per year, emissions. that's not leveling off at all? In 2000s, 15, 16, and 17, there was a leveling off of the emissions globally. And we thought, okay, well, we've reached a plateau here. 
and then the next year it was up 4%, and then that yeah. 3 3 3 percent And part of the problem is China buying coal and just burning it all up, you know? So, I mean, coal manufacturing and coal employment is going down, 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 down. And we need to get off of the rest of the coal, not just sell it to other countries to make a profit. So, yes, we are de decreasing, but not fast enough. Thank you. With the coal that you're saying that they're doing, do all these fires also emit the same type of thing that's going on? Well, yes and no. Um, so we have to understand that the coal was formed from trees a long time ago. Okay? And what we're doing now is if we burn wood, okay, the wood actually has already taken up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as it was growing. So that's a chunk of carbon dioxide in solid form. When you burn wood, like biomass, that's actually re releasing and replacing this carbon dioxide that it already took up. So it's kind of a neutral net gain, if you look at it in that perspective. But um, we're, we're not anywhere near where we need to be. So we need to be ahead of that game, not behind it. Yes? I'll just let you know, I'll put a business card back here. Curry County Voices, this is the fourth monthly meeting of this organization to be filmed. This one will be on our website within a couple of days. They stay on there as long as there's an internet. It's YouTube, other organizations can link to it. Uh, so again, within two or three days, this program will be on our website. Which is? CurryCountyVoices.com. I'll put some business cards out that have the website address on it. And uh, we welcome viewers. It's amazing. Some of the shows down here outdraw all of the elected boards that we videotape meetings for. <laughs> no one has beat the indoor kite flying from last spring or the rescue dog that gave birth to a litter shortly after being rescued. She is still one of our best subjects. <laughs> Hey Tom, yes. I have one question for you as part of that presentation. Does, does this, the scientific community that you're dealing with, uh, do they address any relationship between the brittle scale and uh, climate and global warming? Uh, the brittle scale. In the West? The yeah, the, br the brittle scale. What is the brittle scale? The brittle scale measures the, the, brittle, the brittleness of the planet, basically the brittleness of plants, the brittleness of the desert, the trees. And, and how it's increasing. The brittle scale is also increasing along with the uh, 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 well, You would expect that, but uh, uh, I, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, it's a measured, it's a measured uh, substance, and I'm wondering if they're, if they're looking at that in terms of... Oh, I'm sure uh, somebody is. Yeah, in terms of uh, uh, solutions. I'll let you know. Yes. I've got two questions. I wanted to charge there was a slide you did in 2008. That was when the... You did what? In, the, in all the so emissions, emissions. Uh -huh. and that was because of the downturn, the economic downturn. If we had a huge downturn, would we get some time? Absolutely. So I have, I have a big <laughs> <laughs> well, question. Wars and uh, refugee migration, and, and every time we had a, a global um, downset, you know, different kinds of things that. Uh, recession, or depression. Yeah. Yeah. That slows the emissions because there's lower productivity. Company, the power plants are not working as much. The manufacturing plants are not working as much. And every time it flattens out. There's about five times during the last uh, 100 years when you can see that definite plateau. And then as soon as that recession or depression is over, it starts going up again, then it flattens out again. Take a look again, flattens so out again. time to invest in the renewable energies? When we see the next downturn, because there will be a downturn, wouldn't that be a good time to really put a lot of investment, a lot of um, effort into renewables and green energy? So when it does come back, it'll come back great. Um, I'm not so sure. Yeah, I'm not so sure. Well, the other question I had was on the ocean temperature, or the, the world temperatures. You have the, the slices mm -hmm. yeah. of the average temperature, and it looked like the southern hemisphere was heating up faster 
the northern hemisphere. That doesn't seem like it should be. <coughs> all purple lines? Yeah. That was just globally. Yeah, but still. It was, there was no, was, no southern or northern. That was a global. It was in January, February, I believe, or March. Yeah. And that's, that's summer in the southern <coughs> hemisphere. <coughs> But it's winter up here. Right. Average. It was average, yeah. 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 But how is the southern hemisphere heating? Much less. So the, the Arctic is yeah. heating up the most. I've got about a two minute video that shows every single year and the, and the time lapse all the way through. It shows the uh -huh. Arctic burning up. I have another question. It's kind of a local question. and. Uh, in this area, our power, and I'm not, I don't know a lot about this, but our power comes from Bonneville right? mm -hmm. Dam, correct? Mm -hmm. Hydro electric. Hydro electric. Right. How much? 85 percent. 85 percent. Would it be cost effective to, to do, uh, you know, we're talking about doing some uh, solar panel type of stuff. When you have that in terms of what you're, what you're buying, you know, what, what the cost of that energy is in, in, in warming, um, you know, you buy batteries, you buy all the things that, that are that take to make uh, solar power. Uh -huh. Is it more expensive, global, uh, warming wise, than 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 this uh, It depends on how how the grid is set up. You guys are connected to the big grid on the west coast, so whatever co components make up the big grid is what you're going to get in terms of global influence. So whether you have a solar system in your house or not, it's all going to depend on what the rest of the grid is doing. You're, you're making your contribution, that's great. But whether or not the rest of the grid is plus or minus is all going to depend on how much alternative energy they're using, whether it's a hydroelectric or whether they're using solar or whatever. So your system is your system, and you're going to be contributing positively to solving the problem. Yeah, I'm just wondering if I'm solving the problem or adding to the problem. Yeah, your carbon footprint you're getting out of this, right? Right. Yeah. How much energy does it take to produce that system that you install in your home versus pulling right. it yeah. out? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Compared to using the hydroelectric. Yeah. Because of solar, solar uh, yeah. takes energy and, right. and all yeah. sorts of things to produce it. But net, you're going to be doing a lot, a lot better. And, and you have to think about your system over a 20-year period or a 30-year period, not just how much you spend, right. how much no. you have to yeah. buy, right. put the install. Right. Yeah. Yes? We're, we're pretty sensitive here to the possibility of isolation, you know, I'm getting cut off and for various reasons. And uh, I wonder if, if, you, if in terms of, if we had our own backup, Solar power power storage here. What's what's available to a, co a community at all? Aside from, I mean, just they're being developed all the time. There's uh, grid scale battery systems. Uh, uh, they're in their infancy, but they are produced. And uh, look, I have I have some on my on my slideshow, but they're not. Uh, you know, I didn't focus on them that much. So they're out there. And this is pretty much the standard battery formats. No, oh, yeah. there, there are several different kinds of advanced battery systems now. It's not just uh, lithium-ion or something like that. They've got many different kinds now. Mm -hmm. I, if you send me uh, an email or something, I could hook you up with some of those. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. By the way, Tom, the dollars that I'm talking about are not green dollars. They're carbon dollars. Okay. That's what I'm talking about. And the website, what ev to buy was that dot com? Uh, I just put in ev uh, to buy. But you have a oh, website okay. too, though, eh? I have a website, yeah. No, the ev stuff is on your website. There is, but it's last year's. Oh, okay. Okay. So if you want to get the 2020 or 2021 ev cars, go to their website. They've actually got. 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022. What the manufacturers are already projecting for those years, what they're going to be producing. So you can see what's coming up in the future on that need, need to buy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, another question. The carbon tax or the carbon dividend. Yeah. Um, why isn't it ever considered that the carbon tax 
that money go back into uh, building um, solar or wind or other kinds of things instead of using the money just to redistribute that? Why don't we use that to build less? So the, the question is, why don't we use it for other things? Like maybe, um, well, this is part of what the Green New Deal is, is dealing yes. with. Right. But many of them are, there's probably about 10 different alternative options as to how we should spend that money from the, from the trust. And that's one of them. I mean, putting, you know, giving it back evenly to the, to the households or based on how much they spend on the fossil fuels is one of them. We could, you know, we could send the money out to uh, developing countries or to developing families, poor, poor families, you know, because the justice community is, has been taking the brunt of this for a long time, so why not lift them back up? So there's lots of different arguments about, well, how, how should we spend that money? Where should we send it? So, yes, that's one of the options. Okay. That's only one. So. What do you think it's going to take to get um, people, organization, to develop, uh, to draw back from China, say, uh, the building, the, the production of uh, solar power items and I'm sorry. Term, uh, turbines. And What's so it going to take to do what? To lead the to world in solar that, production? The, hmm? To lead the world in solar production? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you, yeah, it's, it's uh, going to take the administration of our country to realize there's all these advantages and opportunities out there for us to start building alternative energy products and then we can get into the marketplace for solar, wind, more and more different types of alternative energy sources. So without that, I mean, we can develop probably 20 million jobs on alternative energies, and we could be leading the world on many of those if somebody would just move it off through the Congress and, uh, and get it done. But we're not. So that's why we need every one of you to be pitching in to help out. Talk to Lee, talk to Ed, and uh, sign up to do a letter writing campaign or you know, a calling campaign. That's what it's going to take. So here's a, here's a factoid for you. I've talked to many people that have worked in Congress, and every one of them has a, has a slightly different take on this, but every individual piece of information, every, every phone call, every text, every card, every letter, every phone call comes in. They, they believe, they, they basically say, that one piece of information is worth a hundred or a thousand times that from other people who feel the same way, but who are not interested or willing or active enough to send that in. They all say that. So every individual piece of communication that you do is worth a hundred to a thousand times more than not doing it. And that counts to them. They, they record every single one of those and they, have them on a, on, a, on a record <coughs> sheet, and they act based on how people want them to act. So you have the power individually. Think about all the people who are protesting out there. Hundreds of thousands of people protest, and something happens. Something I changes. <laughs> <laughs> I have problems too. But I, have problem. about it. Yeah. I, I hear what you're saying, and you know, right now on your phone, you're getting. If somehow some friend of yours <laughs> connected you to some spot and they asked you to take a poll yeah. and you went along and you thought, yes, okay, I agree with all of that, and you took this poll, yes, your answer is this and that, and you submitted these answers, and at the end you asked for a donation. Of course. Okay, oh, and you said, you know what, not just a minute, young lady. <laughs> And you said to yourself, you know, I do need to, I do need to put my money where my mouth is. And you pushed, the, maybe initially you pushed the five dollar, and then the next day you got five of them. And you thought, geez, five dollars, yeah, five, that's twenty-five today. So you said, well, I could just better go down to a dollar. And the next day you get twenty of them. Hey, so when you put your birdium on every one of these surveys or things, or support, or whatever it takes. I'm going broke. 
this back here. Yes. My thing, Dr. Sukhanik, is talking about calling your congressman. That's very different than these stupid things we get all the time. If we call our congressman, if we call our senator, that's very different. We're just voicing an opinion on ABC or the. You don't have to spend right. any money. You just have to take the time. You're retired. You know, you know that. I know that. It takes about uh, four minutes to fill out. You know, 20 postcards. That's true. So, sign him up. <laughs> that part I would like to do. Good. Because we're tired of pushing the myth. So, how many people here would be willing to go, come to SOCAN to do a, a postcard writing event? I don't think Okay, have you put your name on the list? I have the list from earlier. If I just pass these around, you could maybe just let us know. Well, trust me, this is really important and it's really, really um, very successful. You can, influence, you can influence your members of Congress tremendously by doing this. It doesn't take any money. You'll be on one of the three, so we have to